Hi, my name is EJ Massa. I weirdly feel like I owe a lot to the Super Nintendo. It sparked my passion for problem solving. It presented epic storytelling in a form that I actually wanted to engage in. And it helped me focus my chaotic, creative thoughts into something productive. Honestly, it's safe to say if it wasn't for the Super Nintendo, I may not have gone down the path of being a video producer and consistent content creator that I am today. And I thought, there aren't enough videos with aging millennials describing the toys that they enjoyed as a child. To be fair, they're also my favorite toys as an adult. And as a top 10 list, I could easily just tell you the mechanics or details that make it an objectively good game, but these came at a time in my life that the details of them are intricately woven with the very foundations of my being. So I don't think I'll stop at this. This game had good graphics, so it's good. Uh, there'll be some of that, but I feel adding more context at my relationship with these games, putting you into the period of time that I encountered them might be fun or useful. If not for you, then definitely for me. So that's what I'm gonna do. Also, the order of these games don't really matter until you get to like the top three. Depending on what I had for breakfast or what mood I was in when I wrote the script, it'd probably shuffle the order a little. And before I get into the main list, I'll start with some quick honorable mentions. Castlevania 4. This is one of the few Castlevanias where you can whip in every direction and you do this. And that's enough to make it one of the best Castlevanias. Super Ghouls and Ghosts. This game is very hard, and I don't think I ever got the real ending. I actually didn't play it until it showed up on the Wii Virtual Console, but when it did, I broke my thumbs trying to get through it, and the challenge oddly pleased me. And I'm not a huge hard game type of guy, but it's the great design from Capcom that brought me through it. Final Fantasy IV and Final Fantasy V. Both these RPGs for me are infinitely replayable. I love the ambitious for its time story of Final Fantasy IV and the complex job system of Final Fantasy V. Every year, in fact, I go back and play the four job fiesta for Final Fantasy V and maybe someday I'll make a video specifically about that. Super Street Fighter 2. I'll be honest, I have better memories of the Sega Genesis Special Champion Edition, but I didn't have a fighting game represented in my list, so I'll add it here. I'm sure it's made irrelevant by arcade perfect ports and emulation available elsewhere, but at the time, the combo system and the new characters were right up my alley. When I first subscribed to Nintendo Power, the first issue I received was the one with T-Hawk in the front, and that's important. Super Mario World. I like Super Mario World, but I don't love it. But I like it a lot. Mario 3 always beats it out in my heart, but, but I like it. It feels wrong to leave it off the list proper, but whatever. Breath of Fire series. Capcom has a particular art style for the Super Nintendo. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is, but I really dig it. I was always a fan of dragons, and this RPG series centering around them fueled my love for the genre further. Zelda Third Quest. This is barely a real game. It's a ROM you can find on the internet that combines segments of a Zelda game only delivered on the Japan-only Satellaview, an early experiment in downloading games to a system. I remember seeing a tiny screenshot of it in Nintendo Power and hoping something like that would come to the US. I'm actually surprised Nintendo hasn't ported it to anything. It's Zelda 1 with the Mario All-Stars treatment. Lufia 2 Rise of the Sin Sinistrals. This is technically a prequel to Lufia, where you play the previous generation of heroes from the first game. And I always liked it because you can see the enemies on the screen, and it has really fun puzzles and a Pokemon-like monster mechanic. And with that, on to the main list. Number 10, Super Mario All-Stars. This is the perfect game to start with because it's the game that got me so thirsty to own a Super Nintendo. Our family did have an NES, which I loved. I loved Metroid, Mario, and Zelda. But when it came time to buy a 16-bit system, my older sister held the most sway, and she wanted a Sega Genesis. 
You know that Sega Genesis ad where there's two cars, a sleek, fast, Formula One type car, and then there's a pokey white van? My sister was definitely more aligned with a racing car, and I saw that van, and I was like, well, he seems like he's going a very reasonable speed. My sister was loud, had attitude, and basically embodied the 90s zeitgeist, so the squeaky wheel gets the Genesis, and it was fine. I had fun with Sonic and Street Fighter Special Champion Edition, but the system never completely jived with me. Then one day, I went to a party at the local rich kid's house, and he had a Super Nintendo. And I was very curious to see what it was like because the Nintendo name still held huge sway with me, with the NES and my love of the NES. And first he showed me Star Fox, and yeah, it may not look like much now, but I definitely never saw anything quite like it on the Genesis. Then he showed me Super Mario All-Stars, and weirdly, this blew me away. That's right, seeing King Koopa, we called him King Koopa at the time. And it was also Princess Toadstool, and if I'm being honest, saying Princess Peach, Princess Peach out loud, feels wrong. It feels wrong in my mouth. It feels like a lie. A anyways, King Koopa, seeing him go from this to this, with beautiful flowing red hair, <laughs> boy, I needed to have this. I did end up getting that Super Nintendo. After acquiring a lot of money at my first communion, I announced loudly at the party that I was going to get a Super Nintendo with that money. Which didn't seem to please my parents, and it confused everyone else at the party. But they still took me to the local used game store called Fantasy Realms, and I got that Super Nintendo, along with Super Mario World. I still have it right here too! And the Fantasy Realm sticker, still on it. Fantasy Realms soon went out of business and became an adult bookstore. I did not frequent that store. As often. Weirdly enough, I didn't own Mario All-Stars until I was an adult when a friend gave me a cart. When I was a kid, I rented it and I guess I played and beat it enough to my satisfaction. I got swept up in the sea of other great games on the Super Nintendo. There were plenty of things to play it loud which was the slogan at the time. The game itself is an uncharacteristically generous move from Nintendo. It includes four beautifully remastered NES games, when they could have easily charged full price for each of them. And Kurt and me would absolutely buy each one remastered individually. And I did that on the Game Boy Advance. What more can I say? They're enhanced ports of excellent Mario games and lost levels. They play awesome. I love how the Super Mario 1 theme sounds like it's played on a steel drum. The presentation is fantastic. Nintendo already knew they had to tickle your nostalgia with compressed box art for each game. The box art of the compilation itself has Mario in a top hat, and that's cute. Nintendo thought it was so good, they slapped the ROM on a Wii disc and sold it to you full price. Now that's the Nintendo I know. But in 1993, they were extremely generous, and it made me want a Super Nintendo more than anything. Number 9. Illusion of Gaia A lot of people will say Terranigma is the better game, and I, I never quite got into it, and maybe someday I will, and it'll take this spot on the list. But I actually didn't play this game until I was an adult. When I was a kid, I saw it at the rental store but it sort of had one of those box arts that make it disappear on the shelf with the other games. Not Zoop though. I saw Zoop. Can't miss Zoop. I picked it up on a whim at a used game store near where I went to college. That's entertainment. I was recently graduated from college, basically an adult let loose on the world. The G had a design that sort of made it look like the Z in Zelda had that little design flair on it. Seemed like a good excuse to buy a game as any. And when I got home to my parents' basement where I was living at the time, I popped it into my childhood Super Nintendo, and I was hooked. It's very much in the same vein as Zelda, but more combat-oriented. There are some puzzles, but the focus is on clearing out rooms of enemies, which gives you powers and progresses you in the dungeons. In a big change from a lot of games of the era, the enemies don't respawn. 
which is weirdly satisfying. Committing monster genocide and admiring all the empty rooms. Your character can also change forms to make them more powerful in combat and solve different puzzles. The story is a bit stilted and strange. I'm not sure if that's just shoddy localization or if it's originally like that. All I know is you travel to real life places like Inca ruins and fight giant bosses. And there's one section where you get scurvy and pass out. And there's not too many games where you get scurvy. And that's funny. The gameplay just really hit me at the right time. It's not particularly challenging, but the gameplay and controls are very tight and satisfying. It might be an odd game to include on this list. Some of my honorable mentions maybe deserve it more. But where do you rank a game that you encountered at a crossroads in your life? One that symbolizes returning to your college town a year after you graduated, finding you don't exactly belong there anymore. Working a job as an engineer, starting a career that you don't enjoy and you don't think you'll ever enjoy. Contemplating asking the woman I love to marry me. How do you rank a game that when I played it, I could feel myself hurtling through a portal from childhood to adulthood? How do you rank a game like that? You rank it at number nine. Number eight, Tetris Attack. This game is neither Tetris, nor do you do much attack. I guess the bricks and blocks you send to your opponents are sort of an attack. This game is actually paneled upon, reskinned to be Yoshi's Island themed, and rebranded Tetris because what the heck is paneled upon? Nobody knows. And everyone knows what Tetris is. On the N64, it used the Pokemon license and became Pokemon Puzzle League. And then on the DS, it became Planet Puzzle League. And now you can play the original Panel of the Pond on the Switch Super Nintendo app for some reason. Probably because they didn't want to license Tetris again. Regardless of what this thing is called, it frickin' rules. I'm pretty sure I rented it as a kid because it got positive reviews in Nintendo Power, and I was a pretty open-minded kid. And it immediately charmed me. It's a simple color match game. If you played Candy Crush on your phone, it's a similar concept. Lots of different modes to choose from. I love the puzzle mode where you only get a few moves and you have to clear the screen and the puzzles get increasingly more complicated. There's a pseudo story mode where you battle all sorts of Yoshi Island characters. I think the rebrand to Yoshi's Island was kind of an oddball but brilliant move. You match blocks and send bricks over to sabotage your opponent. As you can see, I picked it up years later at That's Entertainment because I had fond memories of renting it and battling my friends in two-player mode. It was one of the first games I downloaded as a ROM from the internet. I played on my laptop during college, during really boring lectures. It's a great time killer, and I think it holds up really well. And if you come over to my house, we'll play against each other. Count on it. Number seven, Mega Man X3. Sure, the original Mega Man X was the leap forward into the 16-bit era that the series needed. It set up all the foundations of the X series, like dashing, armor upgrades, giant detailed sprites, and Boba Fett. For my money, Mega Man X3 is my favorite. I still have my original car, and to my surprise, it's very expensive on eBay. It must be quite rare. I don't know if you remember, but Toys R Us used to have these tickets that you'd pick up from the gaming section, and you'd bring it up to the register, and then they would go back to a secret room and find a game for you. Well, the Mega Man X3 tickets were always gone, and I wanted it so bad. My dad sensed this, and he found the nearest employee, and he accosted him until the employee called every Toys R Us in the state to see if they had this game, and by luck, one of them did. One of the stores far away had it, and they actually mailed it over to our local store for us to pick up. So I got the sense there weren't many Mega Man X3 carts printed. And then I remember I played the crap out of it for like a day and beat it. My father asked me a few weeks later, Son, how are you enjoying that game that we worked so hard to find? Oh, I beat it weeks ago, father. A look of dismay washed over my father's face. But don't worry, the game will be included in my top 10 Super Nintendo game video that I'll make for the internet. And it was. It is. 
Now, Mega Man X3 improved upon the original by having tons of secrets and upgrades. Adding Zero as a playable character, even if it's limited, it's a tough game, but I always feel the Mega Mans are tough but fair. You of course have selectable boss stages, themed after different environments with animal mavericks at the end to fight. If you don't have their weaknesses, they could be really tough. But if you do, they're almost laughably simple. Which I'm not completely sure is a good thing, but I do love the power progression in this game. You start off noticeably weak. You're getting captured, and then you play a Zero who is a badass and powerful, and he saves you. Then as you beat more robot masters and stages, you acquire armor, different mech suits, heart containers, and energy tanks, so by the end, you're a force to be reckoned with, surpassing even Zero. Now that's how you tell a story through gameplay. And I love when you see obstacles and stages and you can't tackle them until you acquire the appropriate weapon, and you come back later and you try more stuff, and you get more upgrades. It's almost like Metroid backtracking. Not to mention really hidden secrets, like a really obscure way for X to get Zero's lightsaber. The graphics are so on point with every enemy exploding into sprite debris. And of course, all the robot masters explode into a satisfying blue fireball. Oh, I love 16-bit explosion sequences. Probably my favorite explosion sequence is the Sonic 2 explosion sequence. But Mega Man X is a close second. What's your favorite explosion sequence in 16-bit games? Tell me in the comments. It's Mega Man X that laid the foundation, but Mega Man X3 is the series at its peak. Also, Boba Fett's in there. It's good. Number six, Final Fantasy III, or six, whatever. Final Fantasy III was the first RPG I ever played. I remember seeing the very strange commercial featuring a stop-motion Moogle. Okay, kid, show me what you got. Yeah, right. Next! Yes! I love the voice. It reminds me of when everyone wanted Danny DeVito to be the voice of Detective Pikachu. Botched, though! I botched that one. Oh, that's a botched job. Oh. That's bleeding. I need some trash to plug up the cut. I definitely think that Danny DeVito should be in every piece of entertainment. And then after I saw that commercial, I saw a screenshot of this scene in Nintendo Power. And I thought it looked cold and lonely and intriguing. When I saw the box at Blockbuster that had that cheeky Moogle on the box, that Danny DeVito little Moogle, I took a chance on it. And the results were confusing. You had to select actions from a menu. There was a lot of text. It made me feel things. And I didn't realize I could save on the map, so I only saved at save points, and I died a lot in between those save points, so I replayed huge portions of the game. I didn't listen to this guy when he said you could save on the map. I didn't listen. But regardless, I knew it was special. And this overworld music just pierced my stupid young soul. That music alone puts it on the top 10 list. And even though I didn't get past Vargas on my first rental, the game already changed me forever. It was then that I struck up a conversation with a friend at school about Final Fantasy during recess, and he said he'd beaten it already. He'd let me borrow it. But it wasn't Final Fantasy 3. It was actually Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Now this game was developed by Square to teach stupid Americans how to play JRPGs, and it totally worked on me. It eased me into the genre, I actually beat it, and then I went back to Final Fantasy 3 and I got to like, Zozo. I actually borrowed Final Fantasy 3 from an older kid, but then he discovered dating girls, and he never asked for it back, so I still have it. 
<laughs> I never figured out dating girls. Anyways, the plot is clearly ripping off Star Wars. With an evil empire, a Darth Vader analog to the Emperor, you have Returners instead of Rebels. I mean, the first characters are named Vix and Wedge, which is supposed to be Biggs and Wedge, so it's not like they're hiding the ball here. The influence is obvious. Star Wars ripped off enough things itself, so it deserves it. The art design is just very confident, detailed, and uses the power of the Super Nintendo to tell a really compelling story with an equally deep and rewarding battle system. The Magicite system to learn spells is probably my favorite system next to the Materia system from Final Fantasy VII. Tim Rogers uses a term called prestige tours in modern gaming, which is like when a game makes you control through a section of the game and it, it hits you over the head with very important storytelling moments. This is back in the 16-bit era, and Final Fantasy III introduced me to prestige tours. You have this famous section of the Opera House, where one of your characters has to disguise themselves as an actress and take part in an opera, including hilarious digitized samples for the singing. and you have to memorize your lines as well. And like all good prestige tours, they're interrupted by a wise-cracking octopus. Final Fantasy III started a decades-long obsession with RPGs of all kinds. Which brings me to a quick intermission. You may have noticed in some of my B-roll, pieces of tape on my cartridges with dates on them. This is because I had to replace the battery saves on a lot of my favorite games. It's pretty easy to do if you have a soldering iron. And I replaced them with batteries I bought from Amazon. And it's also a good idea to give your game contacts a scrub with a fresh pencil eraser, which is more effective than blowing on it. Sure, you can play Super Nintendo games on anything nowadays, but nothing beats using the actual artifacts from my childhood. Number 5, Super Mario RPG. This game really snuck up on me. The hype for the N64 was at a fever pitch. So the pages of Nintendo Power were full of 3D renders of Super Mario from Mario 64. The 3D renders of Super Mario RPG kind of blended in with the rest. Soon after it was released, it wasn't until a neighbor down the street got it that I got to see it. I was like, this is Mario? in Final Fantasy, all wrapped up in the style of Donkey Kong Country? <laughs> That's all I needed to be sold. I love the charm of this game. I find it much more whimsical and appealing than the later Mario RPG series like Paper Mario, although the Thousand Year Door does come close. Square seamlessly blended original characters like Malo and of course the fan love Gino, with the established characters of the Mushroom Kingdom. The music is amazing, and nothing slaps harder than the Forest Maze theme. Plus, the battle system was super innovative at the time, adding a sense of interactivity with timed hits, which carried on to other Mario RPGs, and even South Park's Sick of Truth. The pre-rendered background elements definitely feel reminiscent of backgrounds that'll come later, like in Final Fantasy VII. You have Square, at its peak, being able to tackle a Mario-type game, it was lightning in a bottle. It's got the lighthearted fun of a Nintendo game, but it also has a darkness and edge that no doubt Square brought to the table. Before the N64 took over, this was a very satisfying swan song for Mario on the Super Nintendo. Number four, Earthbound. When Earthbound was released, it had this absurd large box which made it stand out on the shelf. Even in the local rental store, it had that box on the shelf. And it intrigued my childhood friend and I so much that we rented it for a sleepover. We both were already obsessed with RPGs at this point and all of them were fantasy based. Swords and dragons and magic. When we looked at the back of the box, that giant box, it was an RPG set in modern day. Instead of dark knights and warriors, you had ordinary kids. It was a simple twist on the genre, which nobody really attempted to do. So we rented it, and my dad was confused because they asked for a deposit for the walkthrough guide that came with it. And then we played it all night, 
and into the morning. We played it until we were sick and had to collapse. It made us laugh. It was tough. It gave us a sense of dread and a sense of wonder. As I alluded to, it was a standard JRPG with a modern twist. A sort of vision of America if viewed through a Japanese funhouse mirror. The battles feel like a Dragon Quest type battle, but with this nifty rolling HP counter, which if you can beat the enemies before it rolls down, you can actually survive the fight. Even replaying it today, I'm amazed how funny some of these standard NPCs are. But even with its lighthearted tone, there's a sense of dread and doom lingering over everything, and it gives you purpose to move on with your quest. Plus, there's a scene where the police bring a 10-year-old boy into a room full of cops so that, they, so that they can beat you. Wacky! It's also the only game I don't have a physical cart for, and the price of this cart has ballooned on eBay. I only own it digitally on the SNES Classic and the Wii U. And a few years ago, when that same friend I played Earthbound with all those years ago, when he was getting married, I was his best man. And hours before his bachelor party, I went over his house with my Wii U, and we again played Earthbound as much as we could. We didn't play until we got sick. No, that was for later that night when we partied. Number three, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. I saw this Yoshi Island commercial, which is probably one of the most disgusting commercials in the history of gaming commercials. No more. Sure you don't have room for another little bonus level? Uh oh. It definitely didn't make me want to play the game. I understand it's a ripoff of Monty Python, but seriously, I know you're competing with Sega, but you don't have to compete with Sega like this. But since I was a sucker for all things Mario, I gave it a chance anyway. I got Yoshi's Island for Christmas of 1995, along with a Virtual Boy. And yes, Wario Land was really good. Another game that I think it's a travesty Nintendo hasn't ported to another system or just slapped on the eShop, maybe colorized it a bit. They're leaving money on the table. But even with Nintendo's flashy new system, Yoshi's Island was the one that took me by surprise and captured my heart. Before Yarn Kirby, before Craft Yoshi, there was a Crayola Crayon Yoshi. It's a beautiful art style that tried to portray that innocent, childlike aesthetic. With really cool parallax effects, sprite rotation with the help of an updated FX chip, and whatever effect this is when you touch fuzzy and get dizzy, that's cool too. My favorite was when Kamek would throw goo onto regular enemies and they would warp and grow into boss enemies. This is a game I always return to, in part because it had that right balance of collectibles like the hidden red coins and the flower guys, and it really made you want to get the best score in every level and unlock hidden secrets as a reward. Although, Poochie Ain't Stupid level is not the best reward, because Poochie is stupid. He's really stupid. Look at him. It's a success that never really was reproduced perfectly afterwards. The follow-up Yoshi story was a bit easy and shallow. Yoshi's Island DS is the closest to a good sequel, but it's really more of the same. Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo was such a tight package. Perfect amount of difficulty, and you can make it more difficult by finding all the secrets. And it's all wrapped up in a wonderful presentation that was very unique for its time. Number two. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Take a look at this picture from my ninth birthday. I got money, and I got video games. Look how happy I am. Life was pretty much downhill from there. And not much has changed. I still love money, and I still love video games. And also whiskey. While I did love Zelda 2 in its own bizarre way, it did something completely different. And I can't wait to play it on that weird Zelda Game & Watch. Looking forward to that. But when I saw that Zelda Link to the Past went back to the overhead formula and supercharged it, I won't lie, I was exceedingly pleased. And it starts off so ominous with Princess Zelda calling out telepathically to you. 
Everyone had telepathic powers in the 90s, especially princesses. After chasing your uncle through the rain, you find him wounded in the basement of the castle, and then you are off on your adventure. The way this game weaves story, with basically a gameplay tutorial, is so masterful and seamless, it's mind-blowing that Nintendo figured it out this early. And the attention to detail, heck, I just noticed in this playthrough that you can hear the rain muffled on the roof of the castle. I'm not very observant. In the original Zelda, you would stab everything with this like forward motion sword movement, and it was fine. But in this one, you have an arc with your swing. And with the sound design and the physics of how it impacts enemies, it gave your attack a weight to it. Not to mention how the game handles scope, where you think you have a simple goal of collecting a few amulets and getting the master sword and saving the princess, but then you find out there's this whole other dark world and a bunch of other dungeons to explore. And the boss battles featuring amazing giant sprites and usually you have to use the item you found in the dungeon. Oh, perfect. This game set a formula so successful, Nintendo used it for about 25 years until Breath of the Wild mixed it up a bit. I also can't help but hear Spin Doctors while I play this. <laughs> you see, not only did I get money in Zelda, but I also got the Spin Doctors classic album Pocket Full of Kryptonite on cassette tape, which I listened to constantly while playing Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Also, without Link to the Past, you wouldn't have Link's Awakening, which is actually the best Zelda game, but this isn't about Game Boy. It's about one, two, Princess Neil before you. Number one, Super Metroid and Chrono Trigger. Look, it's my list. I can have two number ones. Like I said, depending on my mood, if I'm feeling more adventury or platformy, Super Metroid's my favorite. If I'm feeling a bit more story driven and cerebral, well, I prefer Chrono Trigger. I remember exactly when I first saw Super Metroid. My mall just got Nobody Beats the Wiz. In playing on the display model Super Nintendo, I could see it. It looked like Metroid. I saw the iconic door, but it was enhanced. I saw Samus, but she was more detailed. I picked up the controller and I ran and jumped around a little. It wasn't stiff like the original, it was fluid. It felt good to move around. And I was a fan of the original Metroid. I loved how creepy and off-putting it was because I'm creepy and off-putting. With the strange music, a lonely world, and Metroids, I believe, are the most terrifying enemy in all of gaming. When I left that Nobody Beats the Wiz, I knew I had to have that game. And luck would have it, I got all A's on my report card, which means I could pick out any toy I wanted. And I picked Super Metroid. Booted it up and I was greeted with this. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Digitized speech. Hell yeah, baby. This is a game all about show and don't tell. You know, besides the lengthy intro where Samus tells you stuff. You walk around an abandoned space station, and the environment tells you the story. You have scientists' bodies on the floor. The container the Metroid was in is smashed. You enter a room, and the baby Metroid is eerily just sitting there. Until gleaming eyes appear, and it's freaking Ridley from the first game. And now he doesn't look like a sick, pathetic duck. He's an awesome, fearsome dragon. When you get down to the planet, it's all quiet. Until you reach the same parts that you saw in the NES game. And the morph ball's in the same spot, but oh, there's a security system. And, and these faces, they turn when you go by. And the music changes, and suddenly you're swamped with space pirates. The environment gives you clues on how to progress. Like you get to this statue of all the bosses in the game and suddenly the eyes break and shoot out a soul or something and they go gray. So you know you have to go back there when you've beaten all the bosses. If this was like Metroid Fusion, Adam would be like yammering at you. Hey Samus, did you notice how the statues are blah 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 blah. No, this game respects your intelligence. And it has some of the best surprising moments I've ever seen in a video game. Like when you push Krokomeyer into this vat of lava and his skin gruesomely melts off and you go over to this wall and as a freaking skeleton he bursts through that wall that's got to be my top 10 scene in any video game ever 
but this isn't a video about the top 10 scenes in any video game ever. This is a video about one, two, Princess will be funny. And it refines the upgrade system from the original, where each upgrade serves its purpose and allows you to backtrack while at the same time making you feel more and more powerful as the game progresses. Until you are basically a god upon this planet. You are a vengeful spirit, wishing to obliterate all that come in your way. The backgrounds and the music come together seamlessly to make this organic, lush, and mysterious world. A masterpiece so strong it influenced Castlevania to change itself from a standard side-scroller to a masterpiece series in its own right. And of course, providing the bread and butter of the whole indie game scene. I remember, I wouldn't even let anybody borrow Super Metroid. I was very protective of it. One time, I let a friend borrow Maximum Carnage, and he sold it to a used game store. I wasn't gonna let that happen to my precious Super Metroid. No. And now Chrono Trigger. I first got wind of Chrono Trigger in the Game of the Year awards in Nintendo Power. It won the Game of the Year, and I never heard of it. And from the pictures, it looked gorgeous, almost like Final Fantasy VI, but even more detailed. I decided to rent it from Blockbuster to see what it was all about, and it blew me away. Even my high expectations. It was one of those games I tried to rent multiple times, and I tried to predict which save slot the next person would rent it would use so that I could continue my game later when my parents would let me rent it again, but it was no use. They kept deleting my save. So I had to wait for my birthday, and it was the only thing I remember getting. I don't remember anything else. I don't even remember if I got money. I don't even remember if I got another Spin Doctors album. This game is basically Back to the Future, mixed with Final Fantasy, in Dragon Ball Z. Sounds like a weird soup, but it totally works. After an accident at the local fair sends your crush into a time portal, you race after her, and that starts a time-hopping adventure with detailed backgrounds, large enemy sprites, and really unique main characters. The game's story starts off as a simple misadventure through time, but in the process, you learn of a world-devouring entity who causes the end of the world, and your team of adventurers start using time travel to try to change that dark future. And it's definitely Back to the Future type rules here, including characters temporarily disappearing if their parents don't get together. It's a game that feels like a culmination of all of Square's work up until that point, wrapped up in a Dragon Quest aesthetic. There's no random battles. All the enemies are on screen, and instead of going into a battle screen, you have battles right on the map. The soundtrack is just perfect. Epic when it needs to be. Mysterious when it needs to be. Or it can convey the feeling of complete desolation. You eventually get a flying time machine, you fall victim to a corrupt justice system, just like real life, and there's a Mode 7 race sequence for no reason besides they just wanted to, damn it. Huh. AD, which stands for Year of Our Lord, and there's also BC, Before Christ. Does, does that mean this world has a Jesus? I bet if Chrono Trigger Universe had a Jesus, it looked like Goku. It's probably Goku. The battle system is awesome. It uses a modified version of the active time battle system from Final Fantasy, but your characters can combine techniques to do dual techs, which adds a ton more strategy to the game. And being a game about time travel, there are multiple endings and multiple ways to complete the game. I think in all, there's 12 different endings. It does a lot with the time travel premise, and all of your actions feel like they hold weight. It feels like what you do really matters as actions ripple across the timeline. So Cryo Trigger, Super Metroid are my favorite games on the Super Nintendo. And there you have it. The games that were really most important to me. Most of these games are available on either Super Nintendo Classic or the Nintendo Switch Super Nintendo service. So those are great places to start if you want to play some of these classics. Illusion of Gaia and Tetris Attack were not re-released, so you'll have to do some naughty naughty things to replay those 
Mega Man X3 is on the Mega Man X Legacy Collection. In Chrono Trigger, you can either scrounge up the DS port or there's a PC port, which I think is fine now. They patched it a bunch. It used to be a really awful mobile port and they patched it. I think it's good now. So you can play it there. So guys, I do have a Twitch channel. EJ Mass uh, uh, is my username or Twitch handle, whatever it's called. And once in a blue moon, I do streaming. I streamed all of Final Fantasy V recently. So follow me on Twitch. I may stream a game every five years or so. So please do that. Until next time, bye.